Cairo is probably more important to ancient history than we have yet to discover. The city is constructed on ancient ruins of which are mostly unknown because the masonry was used to construct the city. The fabled Lost Fourth Pyramid was torn down for the purposes of building Cairo, and the sheer number of times that its residents have come across tombs and lost treasures is enough to at least suggest that Cairo is another city built upon the ruins of the gods. Think about it, the Giza Plateau is right there, then there is Cairo, but the city is modern and is not known to always have been there. So what was there? What is there? More importantly, is Cairo purpose-built on top of something of historical importance? Is the city a giant canopy? Wait, do you hear this? To begin to understand, we must first try to understand a little bit about the history of Cairo. The Old Kingdom of Egypt is also known as the Age of the Pyramids, or Age of the Pyramid Builders. It is a time that is mostly forgotten and surviving only in the form of the mega structures we see today. The historical records of this period are scarce and so-called historians regard the history of the area as literally written in stone and largely architectural in that it is through the monuments and their inscriptions that scholars have been able to construct a history out of their short-sighted biased educational process which as we know is flawed to the point of a fruit that has rotted. The pyramids themselves relay scant information on their builders, but the mortuary temples built nearby and the later stela which accompanied them provided kings names and other important information from the dynastic period. It is therefore through the dynastic period of Egypt that we have to reinterpret the earlier kingdom, just as the dynastic Egyptians themselves had to interpret the kingdom they inherited or found as it were. Inscriptions in stone found elsewhere from the time record various events and the dates of which they occurred. Finally, the tomb of the last king of the 5th dynasty, Unis, provides the first pyramid text which shed light on the religious beliefs of the time. Religious beliefs are thought to have emerged based on actual events of the before time. This is a time that the gods walked among us and is what we may refer to as myth, but there are the oral stories that were inscribed during the re-emergence of Egypt. So what was Cairo? It wasn't a barren wasteland. It was something, right? It may be notable to tell you that Cairo is named after planet Mars. Cairo literally means conqueror. And when it was founded, Mars was rising, the conquering star. There is also a suggestion that King Tut's wound was inflicted not from a carriage, but from crash landing at Cairo in a spaceship of sorts on his way back from a trade agreement with Mars. We know that sounds absolutely insane, guys. We don't need to be told. Swiss scientists say they can prove beyond a doubt that the lost city of Atlantis was on Mars and its astronauts traded with ancient Egypt for thousands of years, suggesting that Egypt was an outpost of the Atlantean Empire. We will link the article below. The origins of present-day Cairo trace back to the Egyptian capital of Memphis, which is believed to have been founded in the early 4th millennium BC, near the head of the Nile Delta, south of the present city. Memphis spread to the north along the east bank of the Nile, and its location has commanded political power ever since. It was there that the Romans constructed their city called Babylon. Muslim Arabs who emerged there from the Arabian Peninsula in 641 later called the site al fustat When a dissident branch of Muslims known as the Fatimid conquered Egypt in 969, they established their headquarters in the city and called it al kahari Cairo. In the 12th century, Christian crusaders attacked Cairo, but they were defeated by a Muslim army from Syria led by Saladin who founded the Ayyubid dynasty in the city. The Mamluk established their capital in the 13th century and the city became renowned throughout Africa, Asia, and Europe before it declined after the mid 14th century. However, when bubonic plague struck the city, it decimated its population. The Ottomans conquered Cairo in 1517 and ruled there until 1798 when the area was captured during an expedition led by Napoleon of France. 
Ottoman rule was restored in 1801, but by the middle of the 19th century, Egypt's foreign debt and the weakness of the Ottoman Empire invited greater European influence in Cairo. The Viceroy Ismail Pasha, who ruled from 1863 to 1879, built many European-style structures in the city and used the occasion of the opening of the Suez Canal northeast of Cairo in 1869 to showcase the city for the European powers. However, much of the development that took place during this period was funded by foreign loans, which led to an increase in the national debt and left Cairo vulnerable to control by Great Britain. The British effectively ruled Egypt from Cairo from the late 19th century through the period after World War I when the foreign presence in Cairo began to diminish. Though the pyramids at Giza, Saqqara, and Dasher are located just outside of Cairo, these vast monuments were not temples of modern Cairo. They are the ruins of a much more ancient and advanced culture that had vanished before the modern era began around 5,000 years ago. They were already there. Modern Cairo today, you may be surprised to learn, is the center of a multi-billion pound smuggling operation. The antiques and artifacts that are being smuggled are coming from Cairo itself. Every few days or so, there are more ancient artifacts found underneath the modern city. This is why we suggest that it is built upon the ruins of a much older city that has vanished into the abyss. It's all hushed up, but every now and again, we see signs of this black trade. When authorities seized a diplomatic pouch at the port in Naples, they weren't expecting to unearth a plot more suited to an Indiana Jones movie. The pouch, which was discovered in March last year, hid an eclectic assortment of Egyptian antiques, colorful pharaonic mummy mask, nearly 200 small artifacts, and more than 20,000 coins. The loot had been stolen from Egypt, and it was clear that powerful and connected individuals were involved. Smuggling of antiques is a trade nearly as old as the artifacts themselves. But for Egypt, the trade has escalated since the Arab Spring, and social media made it easier to access hidden treasures. The crisis is so bad it can be seen from space. Satellite imagery of archaeology sites before and after they were looted show massive craters in the ground where artifacts have been stolen. And there is big money involved. The US-based Antiquities Coalition has established that since 2015, 30 billion dollars US worth of Egyptian antiquities has been illegally smuggled abroad. Even with all the constant looting and smuggling, the vast amount of artifacts under Cairo and the surrounding area is still only 10% excavated. For thousands of years, we have tore and prodded these things, yet there is still 90% hidden under the sand. What does that tell you? So that's it for now, guys. We may do a part two to this. If you like what you have heard so far, let us know below where we can discuss this further. As always, thank you for watching. This is outside the Cairo Museum, or the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, Egypt, and what you're looking at is a dynastic box, likely a sarcophagus, made out of granite, likely from Aswan, or the eastern desert of Egypt. But this, right next to it, this is a pre-dynastic box. This is older than the other one you just looked at, and the precision of its making is astonishing. You'll notice there are no hieroglyphics on it and the flatness of the surfaces are something possibly we could do today but it still would be very difficult in the 21st century. So what you're looking at is an example of something created thousands of years prior to the dynastic Egyptians existing in Egypt and made by a much more ancient culture that also created structures such as the Great Pyramids on the Giza Plateau, 
and the Serapium boxes at Saqqara. Again, with my hand, I can feel an almost perfect curve on the side and here on the top. This had to have been done with lost ancient high technology. And here inside the Cairo Museum are objects in one corner. Uh, unfortunately this is a little out of focus and not in high definition because technically um, you're not supposed to film. But what you're going to see here are the marks of a saw, especially right here. You can see it's a flexible saw of some kind cutting into basalt, which is an extremely hard stone. Lost ancient high technology. We'll repeat everything for you, Jerry. They ended the work, and not like the Romans, they didn't cut it into pieces and use it, they left it. It had to be perfect the first time. If not, we discard it and we do it over. And thank God they left it for us. This is the ultimate smoking gun. No cut, no con. I dropped the mic. As was said in the previous clip by Stephen Mailer, uh, Whoever was operating this saw made a mistake. The saw went off course. Very human trait. This is called the schist disc. Um, the label on it actually says Lotus Display Stand or something. But clearly it's some kind of part of a mechanism of some kind. And in fact, the stone it's made of is not schist. It's much finer and harder. Geologist Susan Moore believes that this is a metamorphosed silt of some kind and thus is very hard and also very resonant. It clearly once fit on some kind of shaft. And here's a side view going up to a top view. Unfortunately, it was really badly repaired because it was found broken. Um, but originally it would have been technically a very fine product. And here you see that the blades are not tilted one way or the other, so it wouldn't pull or push air or water, which is quite curious. It was found in a cache at the site called Saqqara in the 19th century, I believe. And the other objects found with it were 30,000 or 40,000 turned hard stone bowls, which also could not have been created by the dynastic Egyptians because the age of it is prior to the invention even of the potter's wheel. It is quite likely that it's not the only one of its kind. There could have been many more found, and for some strange reason, an out-of-place artifact like this is on display in this museum, and that's what we were seeking on this trip in Cairo in March 2017. Copies have been made using 3D printers, but in order to truly find out what it was and what it did, you would have to make it out of the exact same stone material. And that so far has not been tried. Hopefully it will be in the future. These, they claim, were made more than 4,500 years ago, which is impossible because it's very hard stone and would require the use of a high-speed lathe. This example is very hard diorite stone, so again it would have to be turned on a lathe. The problem is the two protuberances that are on it would get chopped off if you used a lathe. And these are very thin examples, uh, very challenging to a 21st century machinist. So how could they have been made four and a half thousand years ago? And here's the side profile. Again, they would have to have been made on a high speed lathe of some kind. And here is a very curious example, damaged, maybe two millimeters thick, that would have to, have, again, have been made on a lathe. And here the camera comes down on it. Once again, you see how thin it is. And when was the damage caused? Was it caused during the manufacturing or later? Look at the amazing symmetry of it, the thinness. And they even date this one at either being 4,500 years old or possibly older. Now, if five or ten of them had been found, then you could call them anomalies. But they even claim 30 to 40,000 of them were found at Saqqara. That means there was a major manufacturing facility with a high level of technology. That makes these truly amazing artifacts. 
They do not fit in at all with the technology of dynastic Egypt. The fact that they're on display is quite amazing. What else do they have hidden away in the warehouses in Cairo? And this is one of the oddest artifacts of all. It could partly have been done on a lathe, but the folds suggest another kind of technology altogether. This is a truly curious piece. It seems to be made of the same material as the so-called schist disc, but as far as I know, no one knows where the actual quarry of this stone is. And not only did they have lathe technology, they also had high-speed drills with a minimum of diamond tip. And then this large granite box has tube drills. You see the little tube drill holes there? Again, you're talking at least diamond tip technology. And once again, more hollow tube gr uh, drills. Diamond tool technology was not invented, as far as we know, until the 19th century AD. Look at the flatness of these surfaces. This is either diorite or basalt, likely diorite. There's no way that that could have been done by hand, and there's no way it could have been done during dynastic times. Something like this would be a great example of 21st century technology, and yet they label it as if it was made by the dynastic Egyptians. Do they think we're really that stupid? What is clear is that the dynastic Egyptians found this object, and then they carved their hieroglyphics into the surface. The hieroglyphics are not as sophisticated as the surfaces themselves, and that we see over and over again, found objects recycled. And then the curiosity of the elongated headed sculptures of the Amarna or Akhenaten period. It would appear that Akhenaten was trying to tell us something, possibly that his ancestors looked like this. Contrary to popular belief, the Mummy of Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and the six daughters have never been found, so we have no tangible evidence that they themselves had elongated heads. However, Akhenaten is clearly telling us something. So join us in March of 2018 as we return to Egypt to look at these curious objects and other examples of things that do not fit the typical and standard record of history.